Good evening, everybody. Happy Monday. Welcome to What's Up, Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with my cousin, the coach, Lance C. Irvin. And you are watching us live here on YouTube, or if you're watching us on our Facebook page, or if you've downloaded that app, Sports Zone Chicago. That's what we really want you to do. Download that app today, Sports Zone Chicago. You can pick it up on iTunes. You can pick it up on Google Play. You can pick it up on Amazon. Whatever you do, please. Download the app, and we love that you all have tuned in today for another Monday evening of Sports Talk with myself and the man himself who's wearing a Black Hawks <laughs> jersey after they fought off yeah, elimination last night. The Black Hawks <laughs> man, Corey Crawford, is probably in the hospital somewhere getting ice treatment for all the shots he had to face, but they win, they stay alive in the series. How you doing, cuz? Man, I'm doing great, cuz. How are you? Always a great day. Let's get this Monday started right. I'm happy to see you. But 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. What is that you wear? Those are not Julian Jaguar colors. No, these ain't no Julian Jaguar colors, man. Y'all get on my nerve, you dog on Jaguars. Y'all ain't the only school in this city, you know. I got to represent Swoop Swoop Nation, baby. Straight out of Lip Blue Swoop Swoop. You know what they say about the people from Limbloom, right? The students, you guys couldn't get in Julian, and we didn't even need the test to get in Julian. So you decided to go to that school. But that's all right, cuz I still love you. I mean, great school, great school, I think. But no, it's a great school, but who you got a lot of maroon and gold on though. But that's hey, all right. I'm wearing my orange and brown next week. Don't worry. Now, about now it. I know you don't want to start no academic battle between Limbloom and Julian, dog. Come on, man. We oh, we, oh. we we hire half of y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Why we have to go here with the academic battle? You what brought it up? Julian is a great academic institution. We produce your cousin Lance <laughs> Irvin, your cousin Byron <laughs> Irvin, okay. your cousin Cindy Irvin. Julian is a what? It must have been a lot of static. I couldn't like hear what Julian said. Julian is a what? A great academic? Okay. That's what we go on, huh? Sean Streeter, Byron Irvin, Marlon Maxey, just a couple of those guys to name a few that played in the NBA oh, yeah. or, or NFL. I'm not going to flex like that. I'm going to leave you alone on this Monday, but ooh, we got a great show today. We got a great show, man. Speaking of Little, we got a, our world-class athlete coming on the show at 6.30, Shamir Little. If you don't know who she is, you better ask somebody. Shamir Little is one of the best uh, track and field hurdlers in the world, and she's going to be joining us tonight at 6.30 to talk about what she's up to and, you know, the lack of the Olympics this year. So I'm looking forward to talking to her. Guess who else we got on the show? Who we have on the show, Jay? Who do we have? Who do we have? We got my brother from my other high school, the one I actually got a diploma from. <laughs> <laughs> we got Robert Scoop Jackson, who's going to come on. He's going to talk NBA. My Luther South brother, which is the high school I did graduate from, I went there my senior year. Great people there too, man. So I got two schools that I represent all all day and all night, man. I love Lim Bloom and I love Luther South. Jay, so we got my man Scoop Jackson on the on the show today. Scoop, Scoop. my father loved Scoop. Scoop <laughs> is an excellent reporter. Excellent. Oh, Scoop is the man. I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to Scoop. Yeah, me too. Let's go. I mean, Scoop's got a new book out, too. A lot of people don't know that. It's called The Game is Not the Game. So he's going to talk about his book. He's going to talk about the uh, NBA playoffs we started today. We already got two games done. Toronto wins. And uh, who was that winning that first game you told me earlier? Oh, the Denver Nuggets won. They beat the Utah Jazz. I'm not going to say, but uh, Donovan Mitchell only went for 57 in the losing calls. But I mean, I mean, Jay, it seems like every other day somebody in the NBA is getting 60. I think yeah. due to the fact they have more freedom of movement because when your favorite was playing Michael Jordan, the guys was getting clobbered going to the basket. But now you could drive in there freely. You could drive in there, drink a cup of coffee, <laughs> lay it up, and they still won't foul you. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's definitely that the game has changed. They definitely uh, curtailed the rules so that mm -hmm. there is more offense. And that's even down to the high school level. Uh, they were telling us even at the high school level that, you know, they wanted to take out the physicality in the game because they wanted to see the athletes be able to perform and put the ball in the bucket. But, you know, let's be honest, buckets, you know, that's what people come to watch offense. Yeah, they do. You know, people love scoring, and even in every sport these days, hockey, they love scoring, football, they love scoring. So, I mean, I understand it, but I'm like a throwback 
from the vintage days, you know, I'm a bad boy for life. <laughs> like, like, like we was knocking you on the ground, forearm, no fouls, knocking you out the air, no fouls. So, I mean, I get it though. I, I, I get it. Change yeah. Time. yeah. You know, it's just one of those things. Now everybody's into the offensive movement here and you know, it's what, what we have to deal with, but uh, man, I mean, a good day, a beautiful day. So last Monday, <laughs> we, we, we had some technical issues, but we got it. We still got a show across. But we do have our super producer, Maya Kai, is back in the studio. She's producing the show for us this week. After last week, she lost power <laughs> like an hour before the show. There was some serious storms that rolled through the Chicago area. Maya was out power for a few days and didn't have internet until Friday. So thank you, Maya, for producing this show and and putting up with me and this knucklehead here. We we really appreciate it. So, um, but you know, Jason, what what did I tell you about Maya last week? Maya should have went to Starbucks. <laughs> like she was a lawyer to our show. You keep giving my a uh, pass. Next time, Starbucks, my I didn't mean to cut you off because you just keep giving my a pass. Stop giving my a pass. Oh, oh. See, see, this is what happens. See, normally I don't, I don't, I don't show up normally. I normally, I normally don't show up, but I'm not gonna let you talk smack to me, Lance. Because <laughs> see, see, he's like, she's not gonna say anything. She's not gonna say anything. Yes, I was powerless, but the show went on. The show went on. So thank you to Ivan, because Ivan was the one who picked it up and ran with it. Ivan Vargas. So uh, yes, yes. Um, and um, by the way, that Starbucks by my house didn't have power either. Uh-huh, see? There you go, Maya. Where to get on? Tell her. Me. There you go. Uh, there you go. <laughs> hey, All right. Hey, I'm Maya. out, and hopefully, and pretty soon, Joseph will be, um, I'm going to be handing the baton to Joseph here in a second. All right, yeah. guys. Have a hey, good show. Maya. <laughs> see, that's what you get for talking stuff, man. Sitting up here talking all that yin yang. Now nah, look what happened. You got her, her mad at us. But you know, looks like we got Joseph here already. He came early today. So we're Joseph gonna go ahead and bring him in. Yeah, just to remind everybody, this show we are doing in conjunction with the Chicago Crusader newspaper. So go to www.chicagocrusader.com. Make sure you support the Chicago Crusader. And guess what? They also sponsor our poll question and I have the results from last week's poll question. You want to hear the results, Lance? You know I want to hear the results. Come on, cuz. Give me the results. All right. So we asked the question, due to the outpouring of COVID-19 positive tests that were coming up in Major League Baseball, we asked our audience, should Major League, Bans Major League Baseball cancel the remainder of the 2020 baseball season? And our results were... 88% of those who responded said yes. Only 12% said no. So it sounds to me like the public is taking COVID-19 more serious than the major league sports, if you ask me. You know what, cuz? For the past three weeks, it's been a postponed game every day in MLB. Right. Every day for three weeks. So, I mean, I'm going to have to agree with the fans on this one. So hopefully, I mean, they need to come up with something because I don't think they're going to finish. I hope I'm wrong because I love baseball. So mm -hmm. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, you know, and that's the thing, you know, this this whole thing. I mean, the St. Louis Cardinals missed how many games? They were like gone for two weeks. And then they come out this weekend and beat the crap out of the White Sox on Saturday. I, how did y'all lose a team that hadn't played in two weeks? And y'all been playing every day. So I, I was really frustrated with the White Sox. Regarding that, I, I couldn't believe they were losing a team who hadn't played in two weeks. But wait, Jason, the kick is they drove 41 rental cars to Chicago and played. They jumped out the rental cars and still beat us. Oh, I, 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 I was going nuts. I was, I was going nuts. You know, I, I don't know if I've been that angry at a White Sox team before ever in my life. Because just because of what you said, these dudes went to Hertz. <laughs> Rolled up in Hertz like, we need 41 rental cars. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, each one of them like had to drive their own car. Because that's how they, so they all drove their own separate You got coaches, trainers, everybody in their own dang car. I got, wait, wait, here's the funny part. Could you imagine the Hertz person who had to take that water? <laughs> <laughs> like, please take a number, please. <laughs> Do you have your reservations? <laughs> have your reservation ready before you approach the desk. Hey, Jay, I know they did a lot of upgrades for those guys, too, because you can't tell me they drove up in Chevy Corsicas. because nothing wrong with Chevy Corsicas, though, but I, I, I couldn't believe that. 
I no can't believe the cars in the place. And I also can't and I, I also can't believe that they didn't get no police escort because driving up 55, the Illinois State police are out there like crazy. And I'm like, man, I know them fools are speeding there. A caravan of 41 people. I would have been doing that. I would have been doing less than 85. I ain't gonna even lie, dog. I mean, it's 41 hours. You ain't gonna catch everybody. Exactly. 41 cars. Unbelievable. But you know, this is a different type of year, though. Different type of year, but kudos out to the Cardinals, though, because I'm still mad at our socks, but I'm going to leave that alone until later. Yeah, so kudos out to our socks. And, you know, once again, uh, we are sponsored by the Chicago Crusader newspaper. We do have a new poll question that is up. So go to the website now and you can answer the new poll question. So I asked this question, what is the best duo in the NBA's Western Conference? Is it LeBron James and Anthony Davis, Westbrook and James Harden, C.J. McCollum and Damian Lillard, or Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Those are your choices. Make sure you go to the website, click on your choice, and we will have the results next week. But let's get to our buddy from the Chicago Crusader. He is the sports editor. He joins us every week at the top of the show for the opening tip-off. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Phillips. What's up, guys? What's up, Cuz? How are you, sir? What's up, Cuz? How you feeling? Great to see you. Great to see you. So, Joseph, how you been, man? I've been blessed, man. Just enjoying the weekend and uh, had the family reunion, reunion on Saturday on Zoom. You know, over 30 people that was, was there on Zoom. So it was really oh. an interesting experience. I uh, believe. Uh, a bike ride with the missus yesterday. Nice. You know, uh, hitting the lakefront, you know, getting some of that uh, lakefront freshness, you know. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> bike trail, you know, and then I actually I got I got a little hoop in too. I went up to sixty third. Yeah, sixty third and Hayes. Oh, I had my LeBron gym shoes, even though I'm not a LeBron fan. I want LeBron shoes <laughs> and my black jogging suit. So I went up there because some guys they was like, "Look, we know Lori Lightfoot is not going to put the basketball rims back up." So guess what we did? They found the rims and nailed it to the back. <laughs> So I was the rim was hanging down. So I was like, you know what? I'm going. I'm going to do it like the '90s, how we used to do in the Creighton Alley days. We used to just shoot what the rim was. We just shot through it. So I got like got up like 50, 60 shots. You know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Time out. Time out. Time out. I was just gonna ask you. I was like, I could have sworn the man took down all the basketball rim. How the heck this oh, stuff? my goodness. That, that's some Chicago stuff right there. There's a will, there's a way. You know how it go, cuz. Come on, y'all. Y'all know how it go. Yeah, I think me, I think me and Lance have played on a many of makeshift rims back in the day. Y'all exactly. Know that. <laughs> too many. Too many. And I loved every minute of it, too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, Joseph, what you got going on uh, this week in the Chicago Crusader newspaper? What's a couple of stories people need to check you out and read? Well, I, I actually wrote about the Cubs Brewers game, uh, them losing to the Brewers on extra innings. Uh, that was on Saturday, and then also I talk about the uh, Sox Cardinals doubleheader. And I know Lance mentioned the forty-one car caravan uh, bringing in all their uh, negative COVID nineteen players uh, to play their first game since July 29th. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we did get breaking news. I even broke the news on Friday. Which is the um, the 14th that uh, Jim Boylan was fired. So I wrote about the firing of Jim Boylan. I even take you back with a little history of him getting the extension um, last fall, and John Paxson's quotes um, when he was the um, executive vice president of basketball operations on how he thought that Boylan was the man that was going to get them over the hump, and mm -hmm. what Boylan wanted to build for his basketball culture and how he didn't successfully implement that over the past, what, seven or eight months. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, well, let's uh, – Lance, which one of those topics you want to take first? You want to talk about the Cubs over the weekend or you want to talk about Mr. Boylan and his uh, termination? Well, since we just finished talking about Jim Boylan, let's start <laughs> off with the termination. <laughs> I mean, you know, I went on record a couple of weeks ago saying I, I, I like Jim. But that's mm -hmm. off the court. And, you know, I know it's hard being the coach because I'm a coach. But with that being said, the one thing I think the Bulls need to do, 
they're going to have to at some point in time get some better veterans to come there. I like Kobe White. I think he's going to be a really good player. Love marketing. I think Wendell Card is going to be there, Zach. But they need to bring in some veterans that can help the young guys. Nothing against the veterans that they have there now. But I think they need some better players at some point in time, right? Because everybody else at least has two stars at least. If you're going to be a, a, a really good team in the NBA, you have to at least have two stars. What two stars can you say that the Bulls have at this point? I, I think they do that. have two stars. See, I'm going to disagree with you there because I think they do have two stars. I think Jim Boyle and killed one of them. <laughs> That's what I think. I, I think Lori Markkinen is a star. I think he and Zach Levine are stars. I think the coaching killed Lori Markkinen's game. His game got horrible as soon as Boyle showed up. Right. I totally agree with both of you guys. First of all, not only he killed Lori Markkinen's game by forcing him to shoot two-pointers, and told him no longer settle for three pointers. He also killed Zach Levine's All Star chances because I saw, I saw the couple of games that Zach Levine had a chance to explode and he set him down. You know, and I was just like, what is going on? And his comment to the media was, "I'm trying to develop a bench," and I'm like, "How are you trying to develop a bench? You haven't even developed started yet." So that's the problem. You know, I'm like, where, where in basketball you develop a bench before you develop your starters? I've never seen that in my life, ever. I agree with you, John. I, 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 not I, even I, 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 basketball. In yeah. AU, they don't even do that, you know? Yeah, I, I'd much rather learn how to develop how to win. Exactly. <laughs> and if the bench is a part of the win, that's fine. Right. I'm going to win. I mean, I don't know about you, Lance, but I'm trying to win. Right. You know what? We all trying to win. It's a happy medium. Now, with that being said, though, you have to understand who your main players are. Right. Like, I get the bench. I love I love the bench. <laughs> but like you said, Joseph, you don't have time in the NBA to wait on that. You know, the bench will come along. But guys like Lori Marketing, Jay, I just think he's a year away from being a star. I don't think he's there yet. But potential standpoint, I watched him practice last year. I left out of there like – that kid right there is special, but I didn't see it this year. Well, I do I do think he's a year away because Jim Boyle killed two years of his <laughs> development. <laughs> what the hell? You know what I mean? If someone comes in and stifles your growth, then yeah, right. I, I, I agree. I, I think the kid is a star. I think, you know, this coaching change is going to benefit him. I think it's going to benefit the whole team because let's just be honest. They, I think they all like Boyle as a person and from what everybody – uh, is saying he's a great guy, but he just was not a good coach for the Bulls. Now, maybe it'll work for him with another NBA team if he gets another shot, but it definitely didn't work over on Madison. That, I don't think that was like – I love Jim Boylan, but he was more suited for me as like an English teacher or a math <laughs> teacher. You know, and not, no, no offense against Jim. What I'm saying is that, you know, you only can ride somebody coattails for so long. So he tried to come in the door with the whole – I'm a disciple of Greg Popovich, but yeah. Greg Popovich never vouched for him. You know, like I, I, I've never seen Popovich vouching for him. Not no offense against Jim, but he was a little arrogant. He was a little cocky, and because he had the connections in the organization, he felt that he was going to be a lifer, just like Paxson and Foreman was. But he just so happened to jump on the ship when the ship was sinking. It was the end of an era for the whole nepotism that was taking place within the Bulls organization. Now mm -hmm. there's some real accountability. Now you're seeing changes uh, with Mr. Ryan Dorf's son slowly taking over uh, the day-to-day -day operations. And then in addition to that, we're actually finally getting to the post-Michael Jordan era because I really don't even count that as the post-Michael Jordan era. I thought that was just some hating <laughs> on for the past 20-something years. Actually, it's almost 23 years. Isn't that a coincidence? Yeah, it's the curse of 23. Curse of 23. Well, let's stay on the subject just real quick. So, Lance, you know, what do you think about uh, who's going to replace Boiler? You know, who would you like to see? You know, give me, a, give me a name or two that you think would make a good fit. You know what? I think Mark Jackson. I think Mark Jackson has been out of basketball for a while, and I think he did a great job with the Gold State Warriors, right? He was he just happened to be the setup man. So when Steve Kerr came in, he did a great job. And I tell you what, I like Tyrone Lue also too. So I think yeah. those two guys are proud to be on the top of my list. I like Tyrone Lue. I think he does a great job coaching the younger players. 
I think he knows how to motivate the older players to get them to play, and he knows what he's doing. I spent time with him, like, a couple of years back. Him and Nick, really, really good friends. I oh. like those guys. I'm probably missing somebody. But those two, and the dark horse, if he wanted to coach, Kenny Smith. Mm. Wow. Interesting. See, I don't know if Kenny could do it because I think he's been so far removed from the game. And I also think Kenny feel like he's comfortable making his millions sitting there behind the desk like we do as opposed <laughs> to dealing with a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds that you're trying to get them to stay in the hotel room. So, <laughs> but I, I do hear you. Kenny the Jet definitely has some knowledge, but I don't think he's getting out from behind that desk. Joe, who do you think? Wow. Uh, I would love to see Mark Jackson in that position because he's been looked over. For, for, for I, I, it's almost been a decade, right? So, since, since he left Golden State, it's been a while, yeah. It's been a while, so I, I think Mark Jackson should get first dibs on that. Now, Adrian Griffin, you know, I thought he was gonna be next in line because I spoke to him at the All Star game, mm -hmm. and then his next wife came out with some Twitter stuff, you know, trying to throw him under the bus on a Thursday before they made the announcement about Borden, which was that Friday morning. So, I think that's kind of up in the air right now. For, for Adrian, you know, but I think Mark Eversley is going to make that move. Uh, I think what's the former player to play for the San Antonio Spurs? Is it uh, Adele? I can't think of that. Oh, I can't think of that, my friend. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. You don't? Know? Yeah. Adele, you don't know? Oh, Eme. Oh, Eme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eme. Udoka. Yeah. yeah. But um, I think he was a uh, he was under Mark Eversley in Philly, you know, so mm -hmm. there's a possibility there's a connection there. Um, as that 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 young new minority coach, that shiny nickel that the Bulls are looking to hire, and the Bulls that took two PR hits. Uh, the first PR hits was hold, holding on to John Paxson and Gar Foreman for too long, and then the second PR hit was holding on to Jim Boylan for too long, and now they've been forced in this situation to hire another minority, and that's what I think they're going to do. They're going to hire an African American coach. Uh, maybe it will be I do. Maybe it will be Adrian Griffin, or maybe, maybe it will be Mark Jackson, or the little general Avery Johnson. You never know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I've got I've got my pick, guys, and I'm I'm on the uh, M.A. Udoka uh, train for this. Um, he did uh, he did uh, do some work under Popovich down in San Antonio, um, also under Everson. And you know, I ain't gonna lie, I'm being selfish. I want him to get the job because his wife is me alone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know how well he knows that, right. but I know me alone in Love Jones. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say that. Play for I'm, married, also. I'm married, you're gonna get me in trouble. <laughs> I'm staying off that me alone train. <laughs> yeah. He's a pretty good guy, too. And his sister played for Doug Bruno also. His really? sister can really play also. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, see, that yeah, I did he not played know. for Doug Bruno. Okay. Played for Doug Bruno. Mm -hmm. Okay. Joseph, let's, really talk about, let's talk about your Cubs. Um, oh, yeah. I want to hear this. I want to hear this, Joe. Well, they had a rough weekend. You know, the Milwaukee people up here in Wisconsin were elated. <laughs> you know, they took three or four from the Cubs. And, you know, I think the Cubs started off with such a hot start, man. You know, they were bound to lose a series eventually. Uh, you know, tough. You lost a couple of them games with only one run, so it wasn't like they got blown out. They have nothing to be ashamed of. But uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, what you're writing about about your Cubs. Well, uh, I just did a piece on the extra inning games that they lost on Saturday. But one thing I noticed was a trend, and they also lost today, so that's four in a row. And they're probably officially three games ahead of both Milwaukee and St. Louis. If, if, if St. Louis win these next five games, they're back in first place. That's all I got to say. And I told Ivan that earlier. Mm. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to us losing to Milwaukee, first of all, uh, it goes back to what I was saying early on uh, Sean and Maya show. I was saying that they, they have to develop a killer instinct because right now we've been blowing games. We've been beating ourselves. Uh, the starting pitching, I think they're starting to be, a, you know, they're starting to get a little tired. I believe, and I'm not saying that they they worn out. What I'm saying is that you can get mentally tired and have to carry the team um, over a five or six inning um, span and then have to depend on the bullpen to come in and hold the lead. That's very stressful, especially if you don't have any go-to long relievers. And that's what the Cubs are struggling with right now. They don't have that go-to long reliever or that, that one starter that you can throw in to fill in for a guy who can pitch – 
four or five scoreless innings. And I've watched them give up back to back to back three run shots to tie the game and then eventually lose the lead in the next inning and also the game. You know what, Joseph, can I add a little bit too? With that being said, though, I think they bats need to pick it up a little bit too. I think Schroer yeah. is batting like 230. Baez was down at like 20 something, 205, if I was looking at. Wilson Contreras even struggling a little bit. So they bats need to pick it up too. And I do agree with you with the bullpen now. The bullpen been questionable since the season started. Right. So if I'm a if I'm a regular pitcher. If I'm like John Lester and those guys, I do feel a little bit of pressure on me because when you get down to the stretch, you're getting sixth, seventh, eighth inning. You really don't know what you're going to get. Hell, you got one reliever giving up 17 rounds a game almost. Right. I meant to say heck, y'all. Excuse me. <laughs> but with that being said, though, I think you're spot on with, with that. But I think that bats need to, you know, KB, you know, Rizzo a little bit. But I think they need to pick it up a little bit. Yeah, I think, you know, the Cubs bullpen, especially with Craig Kimball, that, that seems to be the, the the big thorn in the side right now. You know, uh, I know he came in the game the other day and didn't do too bad, but they've kind of mm -hmm. moved him from the closers role. Um, I'm not sure if he got in the game today or not. But, um, you know, I think every team goes through these bullpen issues and especially still early in the season trying to find out roles for guys in the bullpen. Um, we'll see how that works out uh, for them. Um, let's jump to the sky real quick while we still got Joseph here these last three minutes, folks. Um, the sky finished the first 11 games of this 22 game season. They have a record of seven and four. They are the top team in the Eastern Conference after blowing out the Atlanta Dream last night. Uh, right now, you know, they're headed toward the playoffs. And I asked Coach Wade last night during the press conference, you know, what do you do? Are you thinking about playoff season? And he gave me a good answer, Coach Lance. You know what he said? What did he say? No. He said, I just want to win. <laughs> and that was it. That was his whole answer. He was like, next question. <laughs> so, I mean, you and Coach, what do you think about that? When, you, when you're when you head above shoulders above everybody else in that Eastern Conference, what are you trying to tell your team to keep them motivated, Lance? Here go the thing, Jay. I think he answered that question perfect. Like, as a coach, you just want to go game by game. But I think what's in the back of his mind was this. They just played Seattle the other day, who's in first place. Seattle beat them by almost 18 to 20 points. And I think Seattle is the best team in, this, in, in the league right now. So he's probably thinking about, hey, we're doing good right now, but the best test that we faced this, at this point in the season, Seattle, they beat us pretty good. So he's definitely going game by game. But I'm happy for this guy. I think they're doing well. But they, they, they'll be fine. I'm getting worried about Diamond D. Shields. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. he's healthy at this at this point in time. But they start as playing a lot of minutes. Yeah, they really are. Joseph, you have any thoughts on the sky before we let you go here? Yeah, uh, like I said, it's always – the thing with the sky, the years I've covered them, they were always kind of like stuck in between that middle. And like I said, I always thought they were like that one star player away. Or they always trade that one star player away before they add that other star player. <laughs> well, yeah. So, they that's where they're at as an organization, uh, especially with the Shields, Diamond the Shields after coming off a great season last season and the year before that. Uh I wouldn't say they're mediocre. What I'm saying is that they're on the rise and hopefully uh they can grow this year and become the team that they imagine themselves being. Yep. Well Joseph Phillips, thank you so much for helping us out here. Tell everybody where they can find you real quick. Okay, guys, uh, if you guys want to check out my stories, please visit chicagocrusader.com. And um, I'd love to, you know, uh, share all my stories with you. God bless. All right. Thanks a lot, Joseph. We'll be right back. Coming up, we got some world-class speed coming on the show, Lance. Get ready. She's coming Woo! up right after this. Woo! I can't wait. I can't wait.
See me. See me. See me. See my dark skin and my kinky hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my tan skin and my curly hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my face wet with tears from years of oppression. See my hands weathered and worn from decades of pulling myself up through your society. See my feet split from centuries of walking your delicate line. See me. See me. See me. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Welcome back, everybody, to What's Up Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with the coach, Lance C. Irvin. And uh, once again, today is a good day to arrest the killers of Breonna Taylor. We're going to keep saying that until we get some justice for this young lady and all the other victims out there. So today is a great day to go ahead and arrest them. Knuckleheads is responsible for that. But um, let's move forward to a little bit of a lighter note. Uh, a reminder, everyone, please put your comments in. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, if you're watching us on YouTube, put those comments in. Uh, Maya's going to screen some of them. We can put them up in the screen. If you got a question for one of our guests who's coming on, if you got something for Lance or myself, and we're going to spend the whole last half hour of the show just kind of talking to you all uh, to see how you have liked these first six weeks of the What's Up Cuz show. We appreciate your support. But Lance, are you ready for some speed? You done muted yourself, cuz. Well, I muted you. Somebody muted you because I can't see you or hear you. You don't want to hear me. You didn't want to hear me talk. That's okay. See, you trying to steal the show. You trying to steal the show. Now, could you start talking <laughs> stuff about me and Shamir school talking up Julian Jaguar nonsense? So that's why you had to be quiet for a while. But I'm going to go ahead and bring this guest on. I'm so happy to have this young lady. I, I've not met her before, surprisingly. As much as I've covered sports in Chicago, I never got a chance to really cover her when she was doing her thing on 61st and Walcott. Wow. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, she, Mira Little is a world class hurdler, and she's got a one one particular event, which is like her signature event. Remind me of Edwin Moses back in the day. But um, Shamir is responsible for bringing us our only state trophy at Limbo because <laughs> she, she like won all the races and got all the points. <laughs> so, but we call it a team trophy. So I'm like, yeah, hey, team Shamir. And that's who, that's who won it. But we just love her to death, and I'm so happy to have her on. And she's gonna talk some track and field and how we can get some more um, some more resources in the CPS and get more kids right. involved in track and field. So without further ado. Let's bring on Lip Loose Fighters, our hero, Shamir Little! <laughs> Hi. Hey, Shamir, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Wow. I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I'm not going to hold it against you that you didn't go to Julian because we would have had a trophy too if you went to Julian. That's how good you were. I semi went to Julian. Um, I live right around the corner from Julian when I was in like kind of my freshman year of high school and then I moved. See, oh, look at that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Julian. <laughs> see, see, she was right around the corner. She still didn't want to go there. <laughs> she rather, yeah, not- she rather risk her life like the rest of us and go to Englewood and go to Julian. Yeah, I was. I had to go to Limbo. There you go. Point. She came to live the world. Shamir, thank you for joining. First of all, where are you from? I know you're you're always traveling. So where are you right now? Like checking in from. I'm at home where I train and currently live. So I'm in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Got you. Okay. Because I know you travel all over the world. We tried to get you last week. You were like, I'm going to be traveling. I was like, well, we'll get you the week after that. Because I didn't want you in an airport somewhere. <laughs> to yeah. Do so. But yeah. Okay. So you're down there in Arkansas. Uh, Lance's, Lance's brother was down in the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville? 
Yeah, yeah Byron went to Arkansas. Uh-huh, that's in Fayetteville. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's where I'm yeah. at. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. 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 So, Shabir, tell us a little bit your story, how you got involved in track and field as a youth. And, you know, obviously we know where you are now with it. But how did you get started in the sport? Uh, my mom, she said she I always tell this story. She calls me a busybody. Um, I guess she was driving um, by the University of Chicago and she saw like a, a bunch of kids, a track program. And she ended up um, just bringing me in and putting me in that track program. And I've like been in there since I was like what, six, five years old, maybe even a little older. Wow. So my second question is, and this is the one I really want to know. So when did you really know that you were fast? Mm. Uh, hmm. I feel like it was different times, fast for different eras of my okay. life. So the first time was when, no, I can't even, the first time, I think the first time when I was ranked like, no, when I did 400 hurdles and I won um, AAU or was the USA uh, Junior Olympics? I forgot which one came first. Okay. But I won in 400 hurdles. That's when I realized, okay, I'm fast because I did something that I really did not want to do. And then I ended up excelling at it. So I was like, okay, maybe it's the talent is there. Okay. See, I thought you were going to say, well, this is one time this pit bull got loose on the block. Oh, no. I, had- <laughs> I, I used to get my head busted when I was younger. No, not really, but as I got older, I was like, okay, this event is not for me. I just slowly started shifting up 100 meters, and then I ended up in the 400 hurdles. Got you. Got- now, when you were younger, did you ever, like, race against boys, and did you beat them? I'm trying to remember racing, like, yeah, when I would go to, because I, I was born in Louisville, so I would spend my summers and um, school breaks in Louisville. I remember racing, like, my dad's friends, my dad and my little cousins. I remember one of my cousins beat me. He was pretty fast. That was probably the only part, like, boy, I couldn't beat. But I really don't race. I didn't race boys like that. You know what? Uh, I have a cousin named Zion Rice. She's a 100-meter hurdler in Georgia. She's the state state champion. So I called her last night and told her you were going to be on the show. She went off. I asked her, has she heard it? She went, Uncle Lanny, Uncle Lanny, she's going to be on the show? I said, yeah. So she texted me a couple of questions. So I don't know. Let me, let me phrase the questions right. She told me to ask you. And I quote, what did you do to get your perfect form? Perfect form? Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you said your form is perfect. Oh, thank you. Listen, some people will say, uh-uh, that form is not right. <laughs> <laughs> I get it from my coaches. A lot of the coaches that I've been with from high school to college, they always emphasize technique. And I feel like, of course, that's the most important thing. So it's really just in practicing, in practice. You practice the form, and then it kind of translates to the meat. I don't know about going over that tenth hurdle. We still working on keeping it, you know, tight. But for the most part, I try to keep the form. And then too, she was like, "Please, Uncle Lady, ask her what's the keys to alternating." I was like, "What's alternating?" <laughs> she was like, "No, she was like, what's the key to alternating?" I'm like, so, and, and she told me, "If you don't ask, she was like, if you don't ask those two questions, Uncle Lanny, don't call me. So please help her out. Please help my little niece." Uh, what's her name? Zion. Yeah. Okay. Pardon so me? the key to alternating, just be fearless. I mean, just as kind of how you practice going over with your dominant leg. Of course, you want to practice, do those same drills in your in your weaker leg. And eventually, it won't be, you know, your dominant leg, but you'll you'll feel a little bit more comfortable um, alternating. So just practice and being fearless. Like, if, like as my coach said, Coach Johnson said, just take it. So that's how I kind of, mm-hmm. if you take it, you get over it. You're like, I guess it was good enough to get me over it. So, okay. With it. <laughs> but it's like my coach and my father used to tell me, you never know if the youth are watching you. And what you did, you help 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 my little niece out because she loves you. So I appreciate oh, you. Thank you. Right you are. 
Not, not, a, not that we done giving Lance's niece free coaching advice. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's get back to some questions for, for Shamir. So, you know, when we started the show in July, you know, unfortunately, you know, we were supposed to be talking about the Olympics around this time of the year. And, you know, I was hoping to be able to get to you and talk to you and you were going to be on the show showing off some gold bling or something. Um, you know, what was it like for you getting that news earlier this year that the Olympics, unfortunately, wasn't going to happen this year? Um, I don't know. As a person who has never made an Olympic team, I don't think that it hits me as hard as it would someone who has made an Olympic team come close. I have medaled. I've been on the world stage. It kind of was just like, um, okay, Olympics is canceled. Like, they need to cancel it. We out here running in the middle of the year. Like, that's my big concern was now, like, you want to have Olympics. What about, what about now? We need to get we need to get it together now. I don't want to be injured. Like, so I kind of just wasn't I, it was, I was bummed out about it because it's like, dang, I wanted to see what this year was going to bring. I was doing good. Training was going well. And then it kind of came probably like within the first month of all this, the, 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 the madness, the uncertainty. So I was just kind of like, I mean, good. I, it's more time to prepare. So I can't complain about that. And, and speaking about preparation, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, you were really on top of your game in 2016. And um, see, look at all the comments. Everybody loves you. This um, is my aunt, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were really on top of your game in 2016. And then, you know, you had one slip up at the absolute worst time possible. And that's what knocked you off from making that Olympic team. How did you process that um, when it happened? And where are you now with that? Because I know that would drive me crazy, but it would also push me to really want to make this next team. Yeah. Um, just being young and just signed my professional contract, probably like at that meet. Um, it kind of broke my heart because it was just like I lost. I lost. I didn't make it to the final round. And it really it really hurt me. You know, it's, you get that salty feeling. You going back to the hotel, you seeing everything unfold, the times you just like, what was I thinking? Um, and I kind of I move past things fairly quickly. I can laugh off something and joke about it and move on like, dang, I got my head buzzed. Like, <laughs> are you me? So. I think I kind of, it, it took me, a, it, I brushed it off. I mean, it hurt, it hurt bad, but it was just like, okay, like whatever. Uh, now looking back, I'm like, all of that money. <laughs> <laughs> that I will never, ever, ever get to get back. I'm just like, first young, I'm like, oh, I lost. Now I'm like, dang, money, <laughs> money opportunities. But you know, you just, you take it, it's a lesson learned. I'm definitely not in that same space that I was during that time. Mm -hmm. Speaking back to then, you said something about how you just signed your contract. I read you went pro early, if that is correct. How did you know you were ready to step out there and turn pro? I wasn't ready. I, I, <laughs> I, was, I wasn't ready, but I was like, you know, I mean, I have to do it. I don't want to stay in college another year. Like, what what is there left to do? Like, I mean, it's whatever. I was actually people, not people. It was like thought, oh, she was gonna go pro her sophomore year, and I was like, go pro. Like, where do y'all even put the first hurdle? Like, don't ask <laughs> me nothing. Basement. Like, you think I'm about to go pro, and I don't even know where the first hurdle goes. Like. So I think knowing that I had the potential to go pro, it kind of set me up. So I said, okay, well, this next year I have to pay attention. I need to pay attention to, you know, the steps, what my coach is telling me so that I can better be prepared and be a little, be prepared to be more independent because that's what it was going to come down to. So, yeah, just the next year, we I, before school even started, I came back, uh, not when school started, I came back before the season started, and I kind of sat down, and I was like, okay, like, it's going to happen. Like, I, I waited a year, like, come on. Like, I know now I know I'm a little bit more wiser. I'm like, I'm ready. Like, I have to get out of here. So right. that's what I did. I hear you. I hear you. Once again, we're being joined by Shamir Little, world-class hurdler. 
What made you concentrate on the 400 meter hurdle? What made me concentrate on the four? When I won, got more accolades in the 400 meter hurdles than I did in <laughs> nearly all my life in the 400. Like, I'm a good 400 runner. I'm a 400 runner that runs the hurdles, but I wasn't winning any AAU titles in the 400. So when I did that in the 400 hurdles, I was like, okay, so this is my calling. This is the mix because I was a 100 hurdler. Uh -huh. And I thought I was just going to be Gail Devers and that wrong, but <laughs> it's the best of both worlds. It's, and it, it's not too bad. Like I can manage it. And then I kind of like what my junior year of high school, I think that's when we kind of settled on the 400 hurdles being my bread and butter. Yeah. So, so in other words, the kind of choice was kind of made for you, but yeah. you know, still got to give you credit because some people will still keep, you know, pushing along, pushing along. And uh, I think you did really good. I, Cause I mean, I mean, when you were at Liberal that year, when you won us our trophy, <laughs> like, didn't you win like three of the events down there though? I ran four events and I won three events. I think the last event I got second and they were, it was like some dispute or whatever, whether I get to take home a trophy or whatever. I was like, mm -hmm. Thing. Give me the trophy. That's right. I earned it. Like, I did what? I got the trophy by myself? Like, come on. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. You mean they're trying to hate on the trophy after you won it? You know, I, don't I, remember. I have to ask my, I, I'm, my memory not that bad, but I asked my mom. I think that it was like we were waiting, waiting. The meet was over. Everybody had packed up. They said, <laughs> And we were sitting and we were waiting. And I guess they were somebody was trying to find some loopholes. What loopholes is there? I scored 39 points or 38 points. Give me the trophy. Like, it's that simple. And it finally came out and they were like, You get to, yeah, you get the trophy. And I took my little, little bitty self <laughs> holding that trophy. I was so happy. Oh, man. I, I know. I talked to Coach McCray earlier. <laughs> Uh, up to date for Liv Lewis. I know she's tuning in watching. She probably got a funny story with that too. Lance, you got another question for Shamir? Oh, you know, definitely do. Shamir, I was watching you run and I saw the bow that you wear. So is the bow is like that a fashion statement or are you superstitious? Um, let me think. I'm not superstitious, but I, I like the energy that comes with when I put my bow on. I notice when I don't have my bow and I'm warming up or whatever, and then I notice when I do have my bow, people like, oh yeah, she got a little pep in her step. Oh, the bow is back. So it's kind of like a confidence booster. It's not a fashion statement because I've been wearing the same color bow. I do like um, neon yellow. I don't think of it as a fashion statement because you think, what, I'm 25 years old walking around with this little bow in my head. Like, oh, but I love it. Everybody else loves it. So I keep it. I guess you could say kind of like superstition, but I'm indifferent about it. You you know what? Just listening to you talk, I love your personality and I'm listening to you. What drives you? Because it seems like you're driven. Like I listen to you say, well, I was running the hurdles, but I wasn't good at that. I'm mean, excuse me. I went to the 400 hurdles. What drives you? Because I'm listening to your mindset and you sound like once you think about something and once you get once you get focused on it, you are focused. So what drives you? What drives me? Um. I think what drives me, I, I don't know. I, it's just the little things. I mean, you want to say, oh, what drives me? I want to be an Olympian. I want to be like, but I have not had a taste of that. I have not come close to that. Like, I didn't even, you know, in the Olympic trials, I got out the second round. So I didn't even get to like get a little sniff of it in the last round. But I think what drives me is just, wanting to be better than I was before. I think I've always said this, like each year I want to be better than I was, than I was before. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. drives me just, I want to be the best. Like I see the potential, I, I know I have the, I have the potential. I could be the best. I just. I hear it and see it in you. I'm pulling for you, seriously, because I see it in you and I coach, right? And one of the things I tell myself is that, through the good or and the bad. Like, I want to be better than what I was yesterday. I want to yes. be better than I was that day. And as long as you stay in focus, 
you got it in you and you were like right there you keep saying you have made a jet which might be true but you right there so close you're right there you're right there <laughs> you get over the hump or the hurdle <laughs> 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 uh, so, I mean, Shaman, let's talk a little bit about that. So, you know, I thought that was a great answer, which you gave, but I also think you gave a great answer before when you were like, I lost that on a lot of money. <laughs> so let's let's talk about money and track and field, because, you know, I don't think a lot of people understand it in terms of how track and field athletes get paid and why so many go over to Europe to compete in those track and field events. And the crowd over in Europe is absolutely nuts at a lot of those meets. Talk to us a little bit just for uh, our viewers so that they understand kind of like how do track and field athletes really go about getting paid? Um, For the most of us, we get paid like primarily through our contract. So, you know, Adidas, Nike, Saucony, like they they pay us. And then we get our other money through going over, going to these meets and we get the money, we get the meat, we get the meat money. And then we probably get like a bonus from our contract. And uh, like the goal is to never use my uh, Adidas money. The goal is let's use, let's pay my my mortgage, my rent from this race. That's right. the goal. So that's kind of like how that's really really how we get get the get the money. Wow! See, she's smart, man. She went to the blue. She like, no, I'm gonna use this money to pay this. <laughs> I ain't gonna be out here broke and y'all be doing no 30 and 30 on me. Talk about I went broke. <laughs> Talk to me about your training. Like, how is your training different from now? I know with COVID and how it was, if it stays the same. Could you talk to me about your training and how you eat, how you staying healthy? Training is different, of course. I think, well, what's this month five or month six? I think for at least four months, we were without a track. Mm. So Coach Johnson, my coach, Chris Johnson from University of Arkansas, he, um, <laughs> he made a, he, a, we adapted very well. Looking back, I'm like, we, he, we did our stuff. Like we would be going to grass fields. We would, you know, do heels. Like we did a, it's not, so when we did get back on the track, it just felt easier. It was like the first day back on the track, I was like, I joked. I like felt like I was like just got out of prison for 15 years and I was on the bike. I was like, oh snap, this is how we coming. So that was cool. We set up a little a little weight room in my garage, and me and um one of my training partners, we was getting up every single, not every single morning, let me not lie, but we was giving up, we was getting up early in the morning and she was coming over and we was just lifting. Like we was really like out here thugging it out. We didn't know when the end was near, but every day we just came to practice and we just had this mindset that, okay, we just, we just got to get through it. And then after those rough practices and weird circumstances, like you, we on the track and we do a hard rep, we want to pass out. But I think at some point we were at like a trail. So people walking by, I'm like, I'm not about to pass out. You breathing all this COVID air. <laughs> so I'm just walking. And I just, those, that time was making me so much stronger mentally and physically. And I'm just, I'm grateful for it. Wow. Yeah. It, you know, it's interesting. You know, I feel for a lot of you athletes, you really got to adapt you know, to these current situations that we have going on across the world. And, you know, the thing is, it's not just affecting you, it's affecting everyone from around the world. Shamir, what has been your, um, what has been your best international experience in terms of what is your favorite country that you've traveled to during your career? Favorite country? I, my favorite country, Lausanne or Monaco. Well, Lausanne, I, I've, I've won my, that's where I get my professional, my first professional one. Uh, nice track, nice atmosphere. And that's the one I explored around the most because I just won. So let me go see <laughs> and just like be a tourist. But Monaco is nice. Monaco is beautiful. I remember going jet skiing out there for the first time ever. Uh, the weather is nice. It's just, Europe is pretty nice. It's not like home, but Europe is very nice. 
Yeah, and, and, and on that note, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question because I, I know we had talked about this a lot, and I know it's a, a big part of uh, what you're trying to do, and it's a big part of what I want to do. Uh, one of my former colleagues in the Chicago Crusader newspaper, Dr. Conrad World, was big in the track and field, and he's a big reason why they are building that indoor track over there in uh, Roseland next to Gately. I don't know if they got it completed yet or not. But they did. They just released the. Uh, I saw a video of it. It looks okay. Like, mm-hmm. Beautiful. So tell me a little bit. How big is that going to be for the kids in our community? In our community, Shamir. That's so big. Like that's that's next level technology. This not the the flat tracks that we <laughs> going on. It's not the outdoor tracks like that. You know, we really don't have that much indoor facilities. If even any aside from the go. Chicago. I know there's one at Chicago State, but that's not that's not safe. But uh but it's a good track though. Oh. But we don't really have um much. I mean we didn't have much. So when that got built and then it's you know I think it's the hydraulic track so it's banked. So it gives it gives people a taste of especially if you trying if you run a track and um you're running track at that so that when you do now that Illinois has opened it up that so that athletes can go to different states, it's not as much of a shock. I think I remember hearing people from Chicago like, oh, that track is banked. Like it was just so different. So now that they get that experience, you know, at home, they get to practice, then they really get to come to these other um, schools, whether it be for college, whether it's even be for high school and they get to they get to show out. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember back when I went to the Bloom in the 80s and seeing the track team and they were running in the hallway. I don't know. Did you have to run in the hallway? I did. Run? See? I ran in the hallway a little bit, but coming from like, I hate that we have to run in the hallway, but it builds character and it's like, where else are we going to run? Right. So, uh, yeah, I ran in the hallway a little bit, but the minute my shins was hurting, I was like, we're getting, mom, we're getting out of here. Like, what? I'm not, I'm not hurting my shins like, <laughs> I'm just stairs we did have a track at Lindblom it's the most it's, you've been up there Jay yeah, I, don't know. I, I wouldn't call the upper level of the gym boys gym a track I, I, I mean we did, we did some things up there but it wasn't really running track, I was that's, not like track. That. that's not a track that's not a track <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a a swimming pool crust it's like a, it's like a Liability hasn't waiting to happen, <laughs> but I, I think I got principal nervous on, so I'm gonna be nice. I'm gonna try to help the school out. But that, uh, some of our, our, our viewers are asking, when are you gonna come out to Gagey to help bless that new track? Um, I don't know when. I I want to come home. My I'm my break is coming up to where I'm done training and competing. And I, every time I come home, last time I was home, I actually stopped by and we kind of did a walk around on the outside of the um, track. So now when I get to go home, I get to, you know, go back and start hope. Maybe I can come like before I start training for the next season and ask Coach Johnson, like, can I just get a week of training in here? Like we have a track, we have a setup. So I would definitely love to come back and see that track. It looks nice. All right, we got a few more minutes here with Shamir Little. Shamir, we're gonna take a break and then we'll come right back and got a couple more for you. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. All right, everybody stay with us. You're watching the What's Up Cuz Show with Jason Palmer and Lance Irvin. We'll be right back. Blessings, everyone. 
It is Johaiza de Jesus, your holistic fitness expert and health educator professional. Your girl is running for Miss Health and Fitness 2020 and to appear on the cover of Muscle and Fitness Hers magazine. Help me make this dream a reality by daily voting. Go to MissHealthAndFitness.com and get your daily votes every day until October 8th. Thank you for tuning in here, streaming live Monday, the What's Up Cuz Show with Lance Irvin and Jason Palmer, 6 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Welcome back, everybody, to What's Up Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer. I'm joined by my cousin, the coach, Lance Irvin. And please go ahead and support Jahaiza De Jesus. She's a good friend of mine. She actually runs track. Shamil, she's inspired by you. She lives down there in uh, Miami. Um, so she's uh, another one of your fans, and she's running for Miss Health and Fitness, and, and she's uh, a hard worker. She's got three kids, and, you know, you see her body. She still work out and give instructions, and I just love JoJo so much. So we got a couple more questions for you, Shamir, and then we'll uh, let you go here. Lance, you got a question for her? Yeah, last week we had an agent on, on, on our show, great guy. Could you talk to me about – what what went into your mind when you picked your agent? Um, kind of like I always look for uh, having a good relationship, like just a person that's easy to talk, just like my coach. You know, I want to have that relationship with my agent because eventually we all have to come together and talk about, you know, my career at some point. So looking for an agent, I just kind of look for someone that was, you know, trustworthy, somebody that. I knew could could get me into some meets. Uh, I remember um, talking to Aries about agents and he was kind of putting me up on game and he kind of gave me a few pointers through that process. And I came across Ricky Sims and the rest was history. Like that's the best, that's the best agent. Like he, do, he does his thing for me, for real. Gotcha. And so my, my question, oh, you got to follow up last? Go ahead. No, I was asking, is it is it is it pace management if I was reading right? Are you still representing yes. right there? Pace, pace so, management. Pace, so did I see that 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 like fast guy, that really, really fast guy? Is it Usain Bolt? Is he represented by them also? Yes, he is. I I met Bolt and I was with Ricky and I was just like, oh, so this. This this how we coming like all right then this is cool like you wanted yeah. to race him too didn't you you wanted you oh, wanted to no. I was not. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah he's he's definitely one of the greatest to ever do it without a doubt you know it's so many so many great track and field athletes you know it's hard to say who's the absolute best but I mean Bolt Bolt was definitely the man so I mean my final question for you Shamir is. Um, obviously, there's a lot of young people who, who watch you, a lot of young people here in Chicago, especially. You know, we, we say we we're going to have you on the show and we just got all sorts of pleasant responses from former coaches and people who are your teammates. You know, just so much love for you. What do you have to say to those young kids in Chicago who, you know, we're dealing with a lot of stuff here in this city. But those young kids who, you know, want to run track. You know, we're, we're starting to get some facilities for them to do that stuff. But for those who really just want to kind of get into the sport, boys and girls, what do you, what do you uh, say to them? Uh, don't let nothing stop you. Don't let distance. Don't let the weather. Don't let haters. Don't let <laughs> nobody stop you. Like there's a million there, there's a million opportunities. And this uh, track being opened up and gately like is going to open the door for so many youth athletes to come and showcase their talent. Like Chicago got some untapped talent for real. People trying to sleep on us because we not out here running in 90 degree weather 24 seven, but <laughs> we definitely got it. We got the grit. Like we're a, uh, we're a different breed. So yeah, my like advice to y'all is just, just go with it. Go for it. I agree. I agree. We got we got a lot of talented athletes here in the, in this city and throughout the whole Chicago land. I know Country Club Hills has got a big. Uh, um, did you you ran for that club? Is that am I, yeah. that right? Okay, yeah, yeah. And I mean, uh, Coach Calhoun is a legend over at Morgan Park. You know, he's always had a good program, and you know, I just want to see the track programs get really good again. You know, I want to see 
Thornton. Yeah, Thornton, yeah. Evanston, you know, Homewood, Flossmoor, Limbloom, Kenwood, Whitney, you know, all the cities. So we got so much talent in this area. And, you know, we're I'm going to do my part to try to keep attention on this issue so that we can get some facilities in the city to help out our kids. So, Shamir, thank you so much. And I cannot let you go because the woman of my life is sitting literally 15 feet away from me and she is giggling all day oh long. So, yeah, so you related to me through Limbloom and you related to my wife through Texas A&M. So. Uh, I, used to, I used to work at A&M too. I worked at A&M too. Throw me out there. Daughter. You can be our adopted daughter? <laughs> Hey, you but say you want to be money, so yeah, I, I can go with that. <laughs> Matter of fact, when Jason starts acting funny, I'm gonna call you the co-host because I love your personality. So when my cousin start acting funny, I'm kicking him out, and we bringing you on. Okay. 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 I don't want to sit on the phone, but. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shabir, we appreciate it. Best of luck with all Thank the training, you. and hopefully this time next year you're coming back and you're wearing that gold medal around your neck, and we can celebrate you. Thank you so much, sister. I love you. Thank Sweet you. Food. Love y'all too. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. Enjoy all right. it. <laughs> Shamir Little. Shamir Little. Wow. What a fun interview, man. In in oh, man. Jason. She was like a ball of life. And you know how some people are energy suckers? Mm -hmm. Man, she just brought energy to the room. Like, seriously, Jay, she was lit up. Great personality. She was well-spoken. I mean, she was easy to talk to. Oh, Jason, that was that was great. And her smile was infectious. So, I mean, Lim Bloom, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give y'all thumbs up today. Thumbs up for Lim Bloom. That's right. Woo! That's right, man. Yeah, I mean, she's she's definitely, you know, one of our more high profile alumni. We have so many great people that, that went to that school. Um, me and my friends are people from Limbo. And, uh, you know, we're not really known for athletics. We are known for our academics more than anything else. But we, we have some athletes and, you know, shout out to all the administration and the coaches over at Limbo. Now, I know they are really trying to change that mindset that we're just an academic institution. I know they are putting an effort into bringing sports programs um, and competitive sports programs to Limbo. They've got stuff like water polo over there. Um, I've gone over there ref water polo. So they have a lot of sports. And, you know, I always told them, hey, you know, Whitney Young finds a way to have successful athletic teams and successful academics. You know, Limbo could be the same way. They could be the jewel of the South Side and it's over there in Inglewood. I think it's really important. You know, because Inkwood gets a bad rap a lot of times. And it's a lot of really good people who live in that community. And even though they have challenges, that doesn't mean that they're not people over there who are really trying to fix the problem and are, are, are really doing their thing in life, too. So, No, definitely. And I think that, Jay, I mean, Limbloom always been a good school, really good school. And they have some players from time to time. They just got to continue to to uh, build on the things that they have over there. And they have a football field across the street that's brand new i think so mm -hmm. they have some things that's in place for them and like like i said and they have some pretty good coaches also like when brooklyn went there she played volleyball in the seventh and eighth grade program i thought it was really good now she ended up going to whitney young who you just talked about mm -hmm. but, with, but with that being said it's a good school all they need is some people just to continue to go there and just to just continue to train them right. But I love Limp Bloom. I'm giving you a hard time, but you know, I like your school. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Huh? Uh, I mean, you know, and it's just so many good, so many good schools out there in Chicago, you know, on the South side as well, you know, they don't get their, don't get their props. And, you know, I think the athletic programs could really be a lot better if, if we could get them the funding. And unfortunately what happens is a lot of these programs are being funded, um, you know, the schools don't have a lot of money. So a lot of time the athletes and their parents are, you know, leading fund drives and, you know, GoFundMe pages and doing car washes and all that. And I, I don't have a problem with that to an extent because I think it also teaches the young people a little bit about it that, hey, you know, if you want to do something like it's going to require money. So <laughs> you have to figure out a way to get it. Um, so, you know, I just think we have to do more to, to bring these resources to these sports programs in the Chicago public schools. It will... Um, it helps cut down on crime, you know. It, it does. When you talk about the resources and the funding, Jay, like she said, she was running on that upstairs track. That's not a full-size track. 
if you look at Morgan Park, two functional baskets in the whole school. What Nick did, what we did at Morgan Park with two functional baskets in the whole school, that's absurd. So, you know, at least I'm glad that we have the track coming on Gately. But like you said, Jay, we need more resources in some of these CPS schools, especially in our neighborhoods. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. And I do think, you know, the city has done a great job in adding football fields. You just mentioned it. Uh, Westinghouse has got a, a, a new football field uh, fairly recently. Uh, Lynn Bloom has a new football field. I think it has an outdoor track, too. And Lynn football field actually has lights, too. Um, mm-hmm. So we are starting to see that. Um, where more schools are starting to have their own football field. And that cuts down on the wear and tear at places like Eckersall and Gately and Stag and many of the stadiums in the past. You know, it, it opens up. And again, my main thing is I want to look out for the young people. I want to give them things to do where they can learn some life lessons and, you know, also at the same time, keep them safe a little bit. So um, so while we wait for school, you want to talk some hockey? <laughs> yeah, let's talk hockey. Let's talk hockey. I mean, Jay, I was sitting there just as nervous as I could be <laughs> yesterday. Well, you you were texting me because it was my father's father in law's 75th birthday. So let yeah, me happy out. birthday, Mr. Shout, Rice. Happy shout, birthday. Out, shout out to Paul, aka Rico Rice. But it was his birthday, and you were texting me, so I was able to slip away. When I slipped away, I see Corey Crawford diving on the ground. Doing scissor kicks, stock, stock, uh, stopping pucks. I mean, Jay, he needs to be the MVP. I mean, that work that he puts in. I mean, he's basically Jay. That's a bad man right now. Take an ice bath, like you said. He's definitely the MVP of the Blackhawks right now. The poor man. I, I feel so bad for Corey. I mean, Corey's got a history of concussions, so him playing goalie and facing fifty shots is probably. <laughs> Not a pretty good idea. I really wish the the Blackhawks could do something with their their defense. You can't keep giving up that many shots on goal, man. I mean, the dude is not Jesus in the net. <laughs> He's not going to stop everything. Jay, they said he stopped like 48 or 49, yeah, 49. shots. Yeah. And then let me ask you this, because you're the big-time hockey guy. Mm-hmm. Are the Golden Knights just better than us? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Why you say that, cuz? You oh, said yeah. that well, they, they, well, Break Lance, it down to me. Break I'm, it down I'm, to I'm, me. Okay, so, Lance, I mean, they're not the number one seed in the conference for no reason. They, they are very well deserving. It's kind of like what you always say. You are what your record is. <laughs> um, their record put them at the top, and they can play. You know what they have? They have four offensive lines that are a threat to score. Okay. Most teams have two. Um, if you're really good and lucky, you'll have three. The Vegas Knights have four. So they actually remind you of the Blackhawks in 2010 and 2013 when we were winning them cups, but the Blackhawks would just come at you in waves and waves and waves. And you never had a chance to take a break on defense because they were constantly putting pressure on you shooting the puck. That's the way Vegas is, and they are big. They're nasty. They're strong. You know, they, they're mean about it. So, you know, I think that's the, the main thing about it. So, you know. I think the Blackhawks are doing the best they can. They're going toe to toe with the Vegas Knights, but you know, it, it's Vegas, man. You, you're going to struggle against a team that's just got way more talent. You know, and right now that's kind of where they are. They got more talent. <laughs> you know, and that's we started to see it. You know, the Blackhawks are barely hanging in there. The man had to make 49 saves for Christ's sake, and he's not going to do that again. If he does that again. Yeah, well, and you know what? He's also playing because his contract ends. So, you know, putting on a performance like that, he probably just put a couple more million in his pocket for somebody who's looking at him next year. He's been good all postseason. Now, let me ask you your last hockey question now. Uh oh, all right. What can we do to make it 3 2? Like, I'm watching, I'm not as, I'm not, a, I don't have as much strategy as you, but man, if we keep him out the power play, Man, and if we don't turn the puck over, can we stay in the game? Like, do does that give us a chance? And does our defense need to do a better job? Because when you're getting that many shots on goal, mm-hmm. I mean, talk to me about that, Jay, a little bit. So just real quick, yes. <laughs> in answer to your question, <laughs> first of all, we need to score on the power play. The Blackhawks are one for 13 or 14 on the power play in the playoffs. You have an extra guy. Like, Mm -hmm. use that to your advantage. You know, um, that's the first thing they can do. The second thing is, it's just like when you're coaching basketball, Lance, 
And Scoop will talk about this when he talk basketball. You can't be turning the ball over, dog. The Blackhawks <laughs> passing has been atrocious. So it's not just me. <laughs> oh, no, it's not just You don't have to know a lot about hockey to know, hey, he keeps giving it to the guy in the other spot. <laughs> yeah, their, their passing has been absolutely god-awful. They're not scoring on the power play. And defensively, you know, that, that's always been a weak part of their game for the past couple of seasons anyway. They need some D-men. And, you know, we're just getting bullied off the puck. And, you know, God God bless Corey, man. I just hope they don't hit the man in the head because I don't want to see him become, you know, another Whoa. CTE statistic. But Whoa. we're going to we're gonna take our uh, last commercial. And then he's here. Scoop. The man himself, Scoop, is here. We're going to come back and talk all about Scoop and his book. And I'm going to go check the door, Scoop, because Amazon's supposed to be delivering your book today. We'll be right back, y'all. <laughs> See me. See me. See me. See my dark skin and my kinky hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my tan skin and my curly hair. See me. Don't see past me. Don't see through me. See me. See my face, wet with tears from years of oppression. See my hands, weathered and worn from decades of pulling myself up through your society. See my feet, split from centuries of walking your delicate line. See me. See me. See me. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. Welcome back, everybody, to What's Up, Cuz. I'm your host, Jason Palmer, along with my cousin, the coach, Lance C. Irvin. He's here as well. How you doing, coach? Man, I'm doing great, Jay. Oh, you done had a wardrobe change. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Oh, yeah. my goodness. You know, I'm, I'm not dealing with you. You know, I'm I, had, not dealing with you. I had to do so. You know, you, so you know I'm special, and don't make no jokes, but you know I'm special. You know, I benefited. I went to two high schools. A lot, some people know, a lot of people don't. But, yeah, I am Limbloom. I'm Swoop Swoop all day long. But a lot of people don't know, my my diploma is from Luther High School. So I, I am a Braves for life. And people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. A lot, some people do. Uh, so I represent two schools. So when I was bringing on the second guest today, I said, okay, I got I to go red now. I got to go red and white. You know, they may have closed our school, but I still got some red in my wardrobe. So <laughs> I'm going to bring them on now. You all know him. He's an ESPN senior writer. He just wrote a book. I ran to the door. My book ain't here yet, Scoop. But that's all right. The book is coming. It, you know, the game is not a game. And I recommend everybody buy this book. I did read the pre preview. But let's let's not wait no more. Bring them on, Maya. Bring Scoop on. There he is. 
My man. My oh, man, Scoop. What's up, my man? What's going on, man? Hey, I'm, I'm representing Simeon right now, so you know, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Scoop, man. Scoop, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, it's Benji, man. It's Benji. So, you know, we still got to. Ben, Benji Hambrick, you still got to have love for it. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, that's 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 love. Yeah, right, man, BJ, right. BJ gets love. Shout out to Robert Smith and Derrick Rose and those guys. Man, school, those, thanks for having me. The whole family. Me. What's going on? What's up, Jay and Lance, the family? Hey, man, how's, how, how's, how's the whole Urban clan going on, man? I ain't touched base with y'all in a minute. Everybody good? Man, everybody good. Byron's doing good. Okay. Nick just got him a job. Uh, uh, Cindy right. is being Cindy. Thank you, okay. running sports administration. Mike, Mike running around. Matt right. and Corey doing the AAU stuff, and Corey got a job. Everybody doing good, school. So I tell them all. You asking. Tell them all. I said, what's up, man? What's up? It's good. Uh, hey, Jay, 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 Jay. We got to get okay. together. And open our school back up, man. We got to get that thing popping again. Eighty seven. The kids ain't the same anymore, man. We got to do something. <laughs> And they ain't did nothing with the building. That's the right. It's, it's just sitting there. It's just sitting there. I, I, hey, school. I think me, and you should just sneak up in there and just turn the lights on, see what happens. Man, the the, <laughs> the, the ghost of Cliff Dow is gonna come take us. <laughs> <laughs> Either him or Pastor Dietrich. <laughs> All right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it broke my heart to see them close move the South, man. A lot of good people came out of there. Yeah. Had a lot of great athletes from Mike Conley to Tony yeah. Martin. To, I mean, so yeah, many Pierre Cooper and yeah. Curtis Goodman, who just passed away. You know, we had some, um, you know, we had some hoopers up in there, man. Ernie, Ernie Mitchell. Woo, we had some great ones, man. We had some good ones. Without Dave, a doubt, man. Dave yeah. Towns was pretty good. Hey, oh, Dave, Dave, Dave's the one to Dave, stop Dave. me from making. Dave's the one to stop me from making the squad. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, just a lot of athletes, here, especially our track teams, our men and women's track teams were killers. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, just really, really miss out on the school. But hey, let's talk to you about what is going on. NBA playoffs have started today. Uh, it's a day everybody's been waiting for. We didn't know if this thing was going to happen. Scoop, right. I, know, I know you've already been watching some games. What do you Man. think just about how the NBA has been able to get this far, as far as they have with, you know, we see what's happened with Major League Baseball, but the NBA, they haven't really had those type of problems. Right well, I, th I think there are two different things that we're looking at. You know, um, I think with the NBA, you had, you, it's much like the NHL, you're trying to finish something. So I think it's an easier sell from, you know, an owner's situation to the players union and the players themselves in trying to finish something as opposed to trying to start something. You couldn't have sold the bubble situation to baseball and football just on the fact that you're trying to complete an entire season. I think to the NHL and the NBA, it was like, look, let's give you a certain amount of time to get your legs back up under you, and then we're going to finish the season. That's an easy to sell. Uh, that's an easy to sell when you're dealing with containment issues and professional athletes and teams and all this, that, and the other. So I think, first off, that's why they were able to do what they've done, and, and baseball has not been able to do that, and football probably won't be able to do that. The second thing I think we have to take consideration, you know, is one size – but two, the basic, basic fundamental fact that, you know, basketball is – breeds a different thing. And I'll say this as lightly as I can. They had a lot of people, especially the NBA. I don't think the NHL got this. And, Jay, you may be able to say something about this. But I know from a media standpoint, the NBA had a lot of people doubting that mm -hmm. they could even pull this off. Mm -hmm. And I really do believe knowing the people, knowing Michelle Roberts a little bit, knowing Chris Paul, knowing Adam Silver, you know, knowing a lot of people that, you know, the owners that sat around and tried to come up with this plan, you know, uh, knowing a lot of the people that were in the room that made the decision to make that happen. I'm pretty sure they used the fuel coming from outside to make sure that they did everything they can to make this happen. Because there was a lot of doubt that was floating around that this could even happen. Now, I even say even for myself in the beginning, I'm like, I, you know, you kept coming up with scenarios like, no, nah, they're probably not thinking about this. They're probably not thinking about this. How are they going to do this? How are they going to? It wasn't even fathomable for us to think that they could pull something like this off. And I'm pretty sure that, that hate, I don't want to call it hate, but that doubt mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they kept hearing from the outside fueled them to make sure they had everything in place and, you know, to make this go the way it's gone so far. So 
you know, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to throw shade. That's why I was very cautious about how I was saying mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I don't want to throw shade and, you know, blanket shade mm -hmm. over the entire, you know, broadcast and media industry as, 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 it, as it, you know, uh, concerns itself with covering the NBA. But there's no other way to put it. And I'm pretty sure that that's part of the reason the NBA has been able to pull it off because that incentive, you know, to prove all of us wrong in this business mm -hmm. I'm sure it has something to do with why we've seen it go so perfectly so far. I think, Scoop, to, to your point, I think, you know, let's be honest. You're talking about mostly brothers, mostly yes. brothers, mostly brothers from the inner city. Yes. I think I think two things were a big key with that, Scoop. One, George Floyd's murder gave them a little bit of extra sense of motivation to go ahead and do this because they know how much basketball means to people in yeah. the community. Two, without doubt. two, I think the NBA is a league where the players run the show. It's not the NFL where the owners run the show. It's not Major League Baseball where they basically run the show. The NBA, the players run that show, baby. Without question. And, 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 the, third, and the third component to that in this specific case is Michael Jordan. You know, mm -hmm. and if, if you heard Adam, Adam Silver speak about the meetings that the owners had over the course of however many weeks trying to get this thing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, set up. You know, he said Michael Jordan was the strongest voice in the room, you know, and it's not only because he's Michael Jordan, but to your point, Jason, he's a former player and he is the only black majority owner in that room. That's so right. He, he very rarely do we as black people get a seat at that table when it comes to ownership. This particular time we did have one. And because of all the things you mentioned, Jay, Michael Jordan was able to address those issues and speak on behalf of why this is so important. When in no other sport, Michael Jordan or somebody like Michael Jordan wouldn't have would have been in that room. So there's a third component in this particular case that even Adam Silver had to admit that amongst all these owners, he had the strongest voice and we were forced to listen to him. Mm -hmm. Man, scope like you see, I could talk to you all day. And when you talk about ownership, like how come we don't have as many owners that you think we should have? I mean, we play the game. We play it well. We smart. How come we don't have owners sitting at the table other than Mike? Well, because if you look at professional sports, very rarely do you have athletes that become owners. It very rarely happens. You know, I, Wayne Gretzky did it in hockey. I think Mario Lemieux did it. They, mm -hmm. they became part owners of, the, of uh, who? Wayne wasn't with Edmund. Edmonton was it, it the, was Kings? the Kings. It was the, the Kings, Kings. right. Yeah. And, Mar and Mario had with the Penguins. Good you bro. know, other than that, you could go through the line of professional sports and look at ownership. And athletes do not transition into owners. They transition into high executive positions, but never owners. So in order for us to do this, and the two brothers, uh, Peter Bino and I forgot the other brother's name, they, they started off having uh, minor, majority ownership with the Denver Nuggets. Uh, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and that was our first foray, foray into having African-American, you know, business men or, and slash women in the, you know, in that role of ownership at the professional level. What you have to understand, Lance, and you understand this, it can't just be players coming into the game and, and saving the game just because they played it. Mm -hmm. And if you look across the broad of sports, that doesn't happen. It has to be somebody from the outside of the game that usually comes in and takes on an ownership role. We in this country have not established um, a foundation where we're sitting you know, on a regular basis, you know, uh, of Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not sitting where we have companies that year after year are, you know, earning billions and billions of dollars. You know, we haven't gained that generational wealth mm -hmm. you know, on one end. And the second end, we haven't earned that, tech, that new technology wealth that comes mm -hmm. with ownership in professional sports. So there's a lot of reasons why we haven't, gotten in the ownership game professional sports you know when everybody else has a head start on us a lot of our <laughs> fortunes if you look if you look at black folks in this country a lot of our fortunes comes from forms of sports and entertainment bottom mm -hmm. line so how many sports and entertainers over the course of history own professional sports teams not many if any at all that's mm -hmm. not the transition and we haven't you know we haven't built that foundation where we have somebody like John Johnson who had, you know, on Johnson Publishing Company. Transit uh -huh. said, you know what? I'm going to get into sports ownership right now. 
We yeah. haven't had individuals like Earl Graves who ran, you know, uh, Black Enterprise. Yeah, yeah, come here and say, hey, I'm going to do this. We haven't had Oprah Winfrey, you know, who right. owned the Enterprise say, hey, I'm going to get it. We haven't had that transition yet. The big time money, the white folks money that we're talking about, we are just now getting to that stage. Mm -hmm. I, we, like I said, it's basically built on generational money or, te or, or you know, technology money. Mm -hmm. We're not in those spaces yet. So, you know, the fact that Michael Jordan is sitting in the room is basically a phenomenon amongst itself. True. Because it doesn't happen. And, you know, you look at the role Magic Johnson has played, and him have some claim on the game because we play it and we know it and we're invested and a large part of our existence and a large part of our black culture is connected to the game of basketball. That ownership piece is a whole nother thing. Now, Michael and Magic, you know, have set, you know, laid some groundwork that'll be much easier for us to follow. So you'll have the Grand Hills that can get an ownership team together and think about purchasing the Atlanta Hawks. You know, yeah. you may have somebody come along, even LeBron, which I think LeBron won't do, but you have other individuals that will come along maybe inside or outside of sports. You know, say, mm -hmm. you know what, we get an ownership group together. It's easier for us now to get an ownership group together mm -hmm. and step through the NBA when the team does come up for sale. Yep. You know, but that mm -hmm. takes that takes generations, and we're just at the infancy stage of that, man. I agree, agree. Once again, we're here with Scoop Jackson, the ESPN senior writer, talking NBA and basketball. Lance, you got a question for Scoop? Definitely, Scoop. So I'm watching. I think the I think the series to me. That's gonna be tough. The first round is the Indiana, uh, is the Indiana Pacers versus the Miami Heat. You have any thoughts on that series for me? Man, look, after watching that first game today between Denver and Utah, man, <laughs> when, 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 when little Mike Conley come back, or another, like they said, you know, uh -huh. right, right, right. You gotta throw that in there. Um, no, when little Mike comes back and, and Bo comes back. I mean, what you saw today, I think, is going to go – that's going to be the series. To me, that's going to be the series because it's funny. Both teams, especially if you look at what happened last year, I said last year this was going to be the Western Conference Finals. And I think both of those teams believe that if you look at what they did last year in the playoffs. This is what going to be one of those series that I really do believe the team that wins is going to feel that – they may be overachieved, and the team that loses is going to feel that they're underachieved. Hmm. You know, both of these teams are you know both that good. Yeah, and, 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 and it's so equally matched up. And they both know they have to go through one another to get to where they want to go, not just this year, but for the next couple of years. Because Utah's like, we're going to get better. Denver's hmm. like, we're going to get better. This, this, you know, this is the beginning. Well, last year really was it, but this is the beginning of what a rivalry is about to happen in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So... I'm looking at that series, especially if it goes down anything like it did today. So, Scoop, Toronto, you know the, what? the defending champions. Yeah, they're for real. Exactly. But it seems as though the rest of the country has forgot they're the defending champs. You know, they did lose Kawhi, but they're a solid team. Tell me a little bit about Toronto. Well, you know, they surprised a lot of people. We thought there was going to be a great fall off, you know, um, when Kawhi <laughs> left the club. You know, seriously, because of the way Kawhi, it looked like at times Kawhi was carrying them during that playoff run last year. And, uh -huh. and even before he got there, you know, they kept falling short to LeBron. And it, we were all like, all right, do they have any intestinal fortitude? You know, so you remove Kawhi, you know, you remove the coach, you remove DeMar DeRozan, and you're left with Ibaka. You know, we, we don't know if – my sons and I talk about this all the time. We were really questionable if Pascal Siakam was going to take that turn. We were like, ah, we don't know. If he, we don't know if he carried that weight. We were like, we, we were worried about that. You know, we are, I've always had a belief in Van Vliet, even when he was at Wichita State. I knew dude could play, but I ain't know he's gonna be this gangster. You know, yeah, we, yeah, we didn't know that. So there was a lot of questions going in that they had to answer. And over the course of the first whatever sixty games before it shut down, they proved they were legit. Now people thought they were gonna fall off in the bubble, but man, you, you know, they carried over. Like, look, this is our crown. Y'all got to take it. And a lot of times teams kind of, they get, they get like, mm, what's the word I want, Lance, without getting the trouble? Huh? Complacent. Yeah, that's, Complacent. That's a better, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was about to use the word shrinkage, but yeah. They, <laughs> <laughs> they get complacent when it comes to defending their title, you know, over the course of a season, especially when you lose somebody like a Kawhi Leonard, you lose one of the three best players in the game. 
man, that dog, they got a number of dogs over there. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how far they can go once they have, once they get past, you know, what they have to get past it. Because the Nets aren't going to lay down. The Nets can ball. But they know that somehow either Boston or Milwaukee is going to be in front of them. And then we're going to see what this team is really made of. But I'm going to tell you right now, they are not going to lay down from anybody. And there's, a, you know, all these dudes out here doing this analytic stuff. Y'all know that don't mean a damn when it comes to this right here. Mm-hmm. Y'all, y'all that don't mean a damn when it comes right here. Hold so on. that's what Toronto was showing today. It, they, look, they're like Portland. They're like, look, y'all got to beat this. And if ours is beating stronger than y'all, then we're going to get anybody. So, right. so, so since you brought up Portland, Scoop, let me go to Portland and the Lakers. What you say is Portland big enough to compete with the Lakers? I, I think mean, I'm well, worried about their size, school. Yeah, you should be worried about the size. And if you looked at the series, you know, uh, well, not the series, but the last couple of games, they gave up so many secondary chances, man. Oh my goodness, teams are like killing. And but but who else is going to rebound besides Nokic? He's like out there by himself trying to rebound because Dame ain't go rebound, Gary Trent ain't go rebound. McCullough may go rebound. I love Miller to death, but he ain't about to crash the boards anymore. So um, my man is out there. Yoki's out there by himself trying to defend. And all teams have to do is rush three or four players to the boards. You can get so many offensive, you know, chances just off secondary chances of getting offensive boards. That's going to be a problem against the Lakers. But, and this is a big but, what are the Lakers going to do to defend their front court? I mean, their back court. What are they yeah. gonna do? See, they struggle. They struggle see, with scoring guards. That's where they miss Avery Bradley. That's mm-hmm. where they miss Avery Bradley. What are they gonna do? You asked a great question. Yeah. Uh, J.R. Smith. I don't know, but LeBron has to handle the ball a lot too, Scoop. So I get nervous about that. Now they make make it through round one, okay, but as I, it goes but, on think, and on, I get a little worried. We don't have to go. The only way I feel that the Lakers are going to come out of this series is fatigue. And not on them, on Portland. To me, mm-hmm. Portland, those last, what was it, five games they played in the bubble, right. the last uh-huh. four games, you know, they're playing at this level already. They have to continue. I don't know of any team. I, I mean, I, look, I was having arguments with all us ESPN guys during the beginning of the season who said Portland wasn't going to make the playoffs, and I couldn't understand that. I'm like, how are you going to take a three seed, a team that has overachieved the last two years and showed you who they really are, and then this year, because they lose their center, and they did get white side, they still got Collins there. They yep. still got a little bit of size down there. But how are you going to say that they're not going to make it? You don't believe in – y'all just don't believe in them. Well, the numbers are telling us that. I mean, once again, you got to deal with that heart. So I've been arguing with these cats. But unless this team is superhuman, like super, superhuman, I really don't see them being able to continue that level of play that they've been playing at the last four games for seven more games Tough. without getting more than two days rest over every game. And to do it against the Lakers. Mm-hmm. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we're being joined by Scoop Jackson. Chicago is always a senior writer and columnist for ESPN. And we got a poll question this week. Remember, go to ChicagoCrusader.com to answer our poll question. Our poll question this week is, what is the best duo in NBA's Western Conference? Is it LeBron and AD? Is it Russell Westbrook and James Harden? Is it CJ McCollum and Damian Lillard? Is it Kawhi Leonard and Paul George? Go to ChicagoCrusader.com to uh, cash your vote there. Scoop, let me ask you about what everybody's talking about here in Chicago right now. The firing of Jim Boyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? I've always been a believer of this, that – Firing sometimes are necessary, but they don't make any sense if you don't have a plan together. And a lot of teams, they look at this situation, and I'll tell you, and I'll bring New Orleans into this too. You know, where you look at this situation and you say, okay, we need a new voice. You know, and I think, you know, the Bulls are like, you know, we got a new GM. We're trying to go a different direction. We need a new voice to get these players, you know, to play up. Now, you know, they got a whole nother player development situation over there with the Bulls that they need to deal with that's beyond coaching. But they need to get somebody to get, but you know, New Orleans said the same thing. We feel, you know, Alvin Gentry is done. We need a new voice in there. My thing has always been if you don't have a plan, 
when you fire a coach, firing the coach is pointless to me. Mm-hmm. What's your plan? And to me, you need to have that plan. Look, the Bulls have had a lot of time to put a plan in effect. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, we're getting rid of boiling. Here's who we're going with. Bam. That's our plan. All right, cool. Now, I can respect that. But to just do that for the sake of doing that, I've always had a problem with that in professional sports. Um, because to me, it always turns out bad when you don't have a plan in effect. Mm-hmm. And I, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm not defending, you know, Jim Boyle at all. You know, I, I understand why the Bulls got rid of him. But we've seen how that organization has operated over the last 10 years. And yeah. I, I think I would be nice by saying they have been dysfunctional. And that's very nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I, I agree. Right. So my question to them is, okay, you got rid of boy. I, you know, you've got rid of a lot of coaches. And let's look at the last three or four coaches they've gotten rid of. They've had no plan. No plan and who they're going to get, except for now they did have a plan with a uh, our man who came from uh, uh from with Fred Hoiberg. Right, right. That was that was a dumbass plan. But that was a plan. <laughs> that, was, that was a Tim Floyd part two plan. Yeah, yeah. I, I I can't even. I think I'm doing the word plan a disservice by even calling that a plan. <laughs> that was not a plan. I, I can't. That's a, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm apologizing to the word plan right now. I'm sorry. I use your name in vain, plan. Look, but they don't have. They didn't have a plan in. They haven't had a plan in the past. A lot of times when they fire coaches, it doesn't seem like they have a plan now. So it's hard for me to get like excited about the Bulls and the coaching change when it all it seems is that they've only done half of the job of the coaching change and don't have a plan in effect of what they want to do to move forward in that position. Well, you know what, Scoop? The only reason why I'm somewhat optimistic is that uh, in the past, you know, those people who fired those previous coaches and then brought in another coach, they're not there no more. So ownership, fact, so ownership, ownership ain't changed, dude. Ownership ain't changed. You're absolutely ownership correct about changed. that. You're right about that. I, 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 and, and, and Jason, you know better than to think some new dude's going to come into Chicago. Rise <laughs> up and start making decisions that rise up and doesn't, doesn't send down. Come on, man, nah. Well, I mean, the other thing too, Skip uh, Scoop, is that you know Michael Reisdorf is kind of taking it a little bit more of the reins away from Jerry. So, I mean, we could have one of those things which was similar to the Blackhawks when when Old Man Words died. His son came in and we saw things change. And I'm not wishing death on Jerry. Let me make sure I make that clear. No, no, I, I, I get that. I get that. But right. look. Who, but look who they got to get in to run things once the decisions were made. Now, I'm not mm-hmm. saying the Bulls haven't done that. Mm-hmm. But when Blackhawks made that move, very similar to the Cubs situation, when they got Theo Epstein, mm-hmm. look who they ran. They went out and got Joe Madden. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Look who the Blackhawks mm-hmm. went out and got. There you, you know go. What? Right. So, you, 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 so the analogy you're making is saying the Bulls are basically going to go out and get somebody of that caliber? I got to be somewhat optimistic. I can't kill all my hope in the Bulls. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'm going to try to attach myself I mean, to. Look, I mean, if you, if you look, 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 look at what we're asking. We're talking yeah. about two of the best managers that, you know, in, in the history of Chicago sports, right. and Quinville and Joe Madden. True. And to your point, in order for that type of change to go on, I get what you're saying about optimism, but you have to be realist at the side at the same time. Yeah. Yes, there could be a general manager change. Yes, it could be, you know, even in, in, the, in the case of the Cubs, the ownership situation. But it still comes down to the decision you make of who's going to run that, who's right. going to be that correct, that, that straight connection to the players. It has to be uh, you know, a Mount Rushmore historic, you know, down in history, top mm-hmm. 10 all-time decision being made if we're gonna make the analogy of the Bulls and put them in comparison with what the Blackhawks have done and what the Cubs have done. Yeah, without a doubt. That, that's a good point, Scoop. That's a real good point. I mean, I mean, my, my thing here, uh, you know, we're now we're talking about, you know, who do we want? People are saying Mark Jackson, uh, Adrian Griffin. There's a lot of names going out there. You know, I don't think there is that Mount Rushmore coach out there, Scoop. So me, my personal choice is I'm going with Udoka just because he married the Neil Long. Tyrone Lou school. Tyrone, I'm not listening. Well, here's the you know Lou, what? Baby. Now here's the deal. I and, and this is just me being real with you all. Um, 
I'd be very surprised. Very surprised. And I hear all these names coming around and everybody's name that has popped up in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I'd be very surprised if gets that call. Oh, Ooh. you don't think so? You know, I, 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 hey, I'm just, I'm, look, I'm not saying it won't happen. We see a lot of things changing. And we're living in a moment of change right now where it seems to be, you know, places that we didn't think, you know, uh, 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 heard our message where folks, you know, where, you know, in this country have been listening to us forever, but never hearing us. We're living in a space right now. We're being heard. So, you know, once again, Jason used the word optimistic. I love I love to be optimistic enough to think that all the names that they're calling out that somebody's going to come in at. But there's something to be said about history. And if you look at the history mm -hmm. of this franchise, name me outside of what is it, Pete Myers? Bill Cartwright. Bill Cartwright, right. Pete Myers and Bill Cartwright. Name me one. Give me, give me, yeah, we go back to Dick Mata. Right. Name me something historically that gives me hope that all these names of these brothers mm -hmm. whose names are going out there, that one of us is going to be next. And yeah. You know what, Scoop? I'm a history guy too. So I can't even. I can't even think of think of that, but I'm sitting here. And you just touched on something, Scoop. Too, Scoop. You know, from a college coaching standpoint, right? Can you talk about the lack of black coaches in college, also? Because I'm seeing us slowly disappear, Scoop. I mean, yeah. there's no more John Thompson, no more John Ravelin, George well, Ravelin. Excuse yeah. me. We losing coaches every other day. We're not getting jobs back. I mean, it's 353 college jobs. I know. It's only I know. like 96 I, well, coaches. I know. Well, you know, let, let, let's go to the leadership. How many presidents of universities are black? How many ADs are black? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? We, we go down this at you, we go down the line and figure out where that's coming from mm -hmm. and who's making these decisions. John Thompson told me something very interesting that I never left, never left my mind. He said, it's a damn shame that. And this is coming from John Thompson, mm -hmm. that black coaches have to be John Thompson in order to get a job. Mm. You know, meaning that you have to have that type of stature. You have to have that type of winning percentage. You have to have had to already won a national title. That the criteria to even be looked at as a black coach to get one of these blue blood schools, to get, you know, a division one school, to, you know, you know, be even be thought of, you have to be like a John Thompson. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we, we know how unfair it's always been to us in every stage of life and business in this country. But Lance, your question is answered to the fact that the criteria is different. It is sad. It is sad. But, you know, you, you know, it's Lenny Hamilton has been doing this thing in Florida State forever. For mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. he used to be mm -hmm. one of the most respected coaches that we had in the game, regardless of whether he's won a national championship or not. Mm -hmm. You know. But the problem is, is that black coaches that come into this game are all going to be held to his standards. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. As somebody that's not black, especially if they're white and male, are not going to be held to the Leonard Hamilton standard. Mm -hmm. They're going to mm -hmm. be held to, you know, whoever, whoever. You know, right. so that's to me, Lance, that's why it is the way it is. Is that that's part of it? I mean, there's not just one reason why you see the decline sure. of black coaches, you know, at the, at the NCAA level, you know, at the college level. You know, uh, to me, it starts off with first us looking at the people who are in position to make those decisions, mm -hmm. and you look at the university presidents. You look at the provosts, you mm -hmm. look at the sports and information directors, and you look at the people who are basically considered the athletic directors that are running these Division I programs. And you'll see how few are black running those things. And those are the people that are in charge of making the decisions, even looking at black mm -hmm. coaches. To mm -hmm. get it. Now, back in the day, we thought, you know, individuals like, you know, a Shaka Smart, you know, mm -hmm. where, you know or, or we looked at somebody like a Jeff Capel. You know, uh -huh. we look at the Tommy Amica and we look at the work that they're doing at the level. And we would think that that would open the eyes and the minds of those decision makers to start looking 
you know, at the Rod Stricklands of the world. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Say, hey, man, you know, we have opportunities here that we think you can feel. We would like to think that. That's mm -hmm. our op that's that's that optimism that Jason talked about. We're mm -hmm. optimistic about this happening. But once again, reality and history are always going to tell a different story for us as opposed to our optimism. Without a doubt. Once again, we're joined by Robert Scoop Jackson here for 10 more minutes. And, you know, I think it's a perfect segue because guess what, Scoop? The Amazon man showed up. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to talk to I Scoop. I got the book. He came and Scoop was talking. My wife ran down and gave this to me off the camera. Your book, The Game is Not a Game. You know, the I, was about to, I, I, politics in American sports. I was about to put the blame on Trump and the whole mail system. I, was about to, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that now. You can't do that. You can't I can't do that. do that now. <laughs> so, <laughs> obviously, oh, 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 Jay, let me tell you uh, something really funny. It's funny that you said that because the last chapter, if you look at the last chapter of that book, the okay. epilogue, the epilogue oh. is about college coaches, it's about Eddie Robinson. Nice. It's very interesting. Okay, yeah, as a matter of fact, you titled it Eddie. That's yeah. what the epilogue is, titled That's Eddie. Funny, we're, talking about, we're talking about the lack of black college coaches at the basketball level. We haven't even got to the football level, so yeah. See? Right. So, Scoop, talk to me about this book. What what, what inspired you to write this book? Um, and I, I don't know if you timed it like this. It came out in March. But, right. I mean, it was almost like perfect timing with, like, everything that's happening, all the social justice efforts that are happening around the country um, your book is now out. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you and what can readers expect from reading? Well, in all honesty, man, the last chapter kind of sums it all up. Um, and it's basically, there was a website that did this list of the, I think it was either 10 or 20 greatest college football coaches of all time. Mm -hmm. And they apologized for putting Eddie Robinson on that list. Mm. They said, well, they, they, they said, you know, well, yeah, there'll probably be some controversy here, but it's almost like that. We figured that we might as well throw him in here. Like he was an afterthought. Mm. The man who has not only the most before Joe Paterno, the man who has the most victories in the history of NCAA football and the one who's had the most NFL players come from his program is an afterthought. And all that does, all, the only reason is because of that is because of the way he taught and the color of his skin in my mind. Yep. So yep. when you see stuff like that, as a journalist, as a black journalist, you know, who's always taking responsibility very seriously and never taking responsibility for granted, you can't let that just ride. Nope. You know what I'm saying? You, you can't let that ride without saying something and speaking out about that. So that's the reason I had to write this book. Because mm -hmm. you start seeing some of these things go down and it becomes collective. And um, I've been I've been in ESPN 15 years now. And over mm -hmm. the last four years, I have transitioned from being a senior writer for dot com to a senior writer for Sports Center. And because of that transition, I was no longer writing columns. I was no longer writing opinionated feature stories. You know, I was writing feature stories that were story telling stories for Sports Center. So it was a whole different lane. But all these chapters in a book would have been columns I would have been writing for ESPN. So basically what I did over the last two years, well, two years before that, was basically turn what would be chapters, I mean, would be columns into chapters. I, nice. just, I just took deep dives in the research to flush out the points I was trying to make and the stories I was trying to tell and back them up with research to make the reader think about what I was saying in a way they probably wouldn't have before. You know, I'm actually doing the same thing, Scoop, myself. I'm writing a book, and basically it's columns that I would have written on the crime uh, issues that we have here in Chicago, but it really gets to the root of them. Um, right. I think too often the media is just saying, oh, it's gangs and drugs. It's gangs and drugs. But that's a part of it. It's, it's a, a part, part of it. Of it. So, so many layers. So many layers. There's so many layers of this thing like an onion, and that's basically what my book is going to be about. Beautiful. I'm taking the same, same approach as you. You got a chapter in here on Colin Kaepernick. Yes. Um, talk to me a little bit about that particular chapter. Well, basically, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, I, I looked at Colin and once again, the book was completed two years ago. So we're talking mm. about the timing of it coming out. I wanted to release it last year. For some reason, the publishing company you wanted to make sure it was right. Um, it was nine chapters to start off with. And they wanted it to extend it to 13 because they thought there was more things that I could like get into and say and dive into. So credit to them. 
because it wound up being perfect timing and it lent itself to what I, what I saw in Kaepernick four years ago was not, he was the one that was on out front, but you know, there were so many other things going on behind the scenes, not just him, but that behind the scenes in sports that were being talked about that were connected to the same passion that he had about protecting us as black folks when it came to injustice. Mm -hmm. And I just used Colin because I couldn't talk about the NFL the way I talked about it without singling him out and talking about and trying to put in perspective what his plight mm -hmm. was all about. And um, I wanted to put that in the context of something I had not read yet or heard yet in with us in the media covering him. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I tried to do in like 5,000, no, probably like closer to eight to 10,000 words mm -hmm. on the chapter on Colin was make you realize that one, we in the media are responsible for not holding fire to the feet of the owners during this whole period of time and making them say that they blackballed this dude. Right. But that's I don't. On us. We never came out and made ownership own up to that. And, you know, and we never asked them, like we, and that's on us, but I, I put I put the blame on us in the book. So that's in the chapter. What's mm -hmm. also in the chapter is asking the NFL and asking those owners to explain to us and letting the reader think, just make sense of this. Tell me how a man goes from the 26th or 27th rated quarterback in the league, mm -hmm. in the league, having a job, but no, no, yeah, wait, wait, without mm -hmm. injury, mm -hmm. and over a four month period, go from number 26 rank the league to below 90th because every team carries three quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. So, you're telling me that this man, without injury, over the course of four months, not an entire calendar year, four months, that he dropped from 26 to 90. Mm -hmm. And explain to me why he's in the league based on that. Yep. And, right. And also to go back and make them understand that Colin Kaepernick never asked for this. We put this responsibility on him. And regardless of whether you agree with him or not, you have to respect him for not running away from this. I agree. Last question for you, Scoop. We got a couple of minutes before we have to get out of here. It comes from actually a viewer. Um, can we post that comment up there, my? Uh, that question came from Charles Johnson, and his question is, hey, Scoop, what would you say has been the defining moment of your career in terms of clarity of purpose? Wow. Man, um, that's heavy, heavy Scoop. That's Charles. Yeah, that's a deep one. Um, <laughs> I'll honestly say this. It's, it's not just one moment, but it is a period. Uh, that existed over uh, um, a course of time. And I, I would say my entire 15 years at ESPN. And I only say that because um, I still have this belief and I function with this belief that I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. My mm -hmm. background uh, is not, I, I didn't go to one of these elite media schools. Yep. You know, I, I didn't come from a newspaper, you know, or, or sports intrinsic background. You know, I didn't come from Sports Illustrated. I didn't come from New York Times. You know, I, I didn't I don't have that pedigree. And gotcha. for me to even be at ESPN is similar to a playground legend making it to the league. Gotcha. So gotcha. the fact that I've been able to sustain this for 15 years in my mind is probably the defining moment of my career, because in my mind, ESPN pulled me in to fire me in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> serious? No, I'm being serious. I'm I, 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 they, I they wanted to make me an example in my mind, and they never. That's just my thinking. Uh -huh. But you know, I you know they pulled me in to say, "All right, man, we tried, we tried a brother like this, and he didn't work out, so now we don't have to try it again." Gotcha. You know? And for some reason, somehow, by the grace of God and everybody else, every other higher power you could think of, you still I, there, I, right? I'm still there. Yeah, thank so you. To me, and in my mind, I'm not supposed to be there. 
So that's that's well, Scoop, the, that's the Scoop, defining moment. Scoop, we're glad you're there. We're glad you were here too. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Everyone, go out buy the book. The game is not a game. By my brother from Luther South, Sue Jackson. Love you, baby. Great for life. Love you Talk to y'all soon. Appreciate y'all having me on. It's love. All right. Last yeah. minute of the show. I'm gonna turn it over to Lance Urban. And Maya, Kyle, Lance, you got something special to say. It's a big day for you. I have something special to say. For 24 years, my lovely wife, Paula, put up with me. Even though I'm a great guy, she might say something different. But I just want to wish her a happy anniversary with her fine and intelligent self and my daughter, Brooklyn. So happy anniversary to my beautiful wife, Paula. 24 years. I love you. And uh, continue to be the best wife you could possibly be. Oh, that's so beautiful. I ain't going to even make no joke on that. I'm just going to be out. I'm going to let you go. Uh, hey, man, you ain't got to bring that up. I love you, Paul. I love you, Brooklyn. Love you too, cuz. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will see you next Monday on What's Up, Cuz. We out. Peace. Peace.